Welcome to this webinar series, Kansas Specialty Crop Spotlight Series with our friends from Rami Farms. This webinar series is generously supported by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and put it on, on part with the Kansas Farmers Union, the Local Food Safety Collaborative, the National Farmers Union, and K-State Research and Extension. I am part of the National Farmers Union, and National Farmers Union is a grassroots producer-driven organization that believes strong family agriculture is the basis for thriving rural communities. And as part of that work, we have the Local Food Safety Collaborative, and it's a cooperative agreement between the National Farmers Union Foundation and the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. And it provides outreach, education, and training to small fruit and vegetable growers and processors on the Food Safety Modernization Act, otherwise known as FISMA. And we have a network of partners across the country working to implement food safety projects and expand reach. Some of those partners are on the call with us today. So here's our run of show. We're gonna get a wonderful welcome from Kansas celebrity, Don Teske. Then Mary Howell will give us a brief introduction of the Food Safety Modernization Act and Produce Safety. After that, I'll be joined by Kale Jamerson and Don and Susan from Rami Farms. We're gonna visit their farm virtually with some video clips and have a robust discussion. And you're more than welcome to participate in that part. Ask us questions in the chat box or come off mute. And then we'll wrap up for the day around 8.55, your time. Oh, thank you. This, this slide is specifically for me because I always forget. This is a grant funded project. And so to help more programming like this, we'll really ask that you help please fill out the evaluations after the webinar. It means a lot to us so we can always improve. And it's great to share that information with the FDA and other partners. So and with that, Don, I'm going to pass the mic to you for a brief introduction. Thank you, sir. Uh, just want to welcome you here tonight. I don't have much to say or contribute, but uh, we've been doing a series of Thursday nights with the Kansas Farmers Union family and so for the next three weeks, this is going to be focusing on our FISMA outreach and, and the odd year of COVID, uh, we've historically been doing this with on-farm tours and sites and education. And we've had to modify our sales to get by this year, just like the rest of the world has had to and all of you. And so we're doing it virtually. And so cool thing about this is can do it from our living room. Uh, what is this, the fourth year now that we've been doing this, Billy? And uh, uh, Mary, Mercedes Taylor Puckett and Mary Hal have been the two collaborators on the Kansas Farmers Union staff that has implemented this. And they've done all the work and I stayed clear the heck out of the way. So Billy's done a little bit of a introduction about Farmers Union, if you're not familiar with that, uh, in Kansas, we're the oldest active general farm organization. And part of our triangle is education, and this falls right into that. So uh, I'll quit boring you and turn it over to Mary. You ready, Mary? I am. So I put together some slides for you. The Food Safety Modernization Act, as Billy said, we affectionately call it FISMA, was signed into law by President Obama January 4th, 2011. And it was the first ever mandatory standard for growing, harvesting, packing, and holding produce. Everyone in the food chain should care about the safety and integrity of how food is produced and handled in order to minimize risk. Why should we care? Pathogens can not only make a person ill, but they can kill you. And I should have added one more thing there. And that is, is if an outbreak is ever traced back to your farm, it can put you out of business. So you, it is important that you handle things as safely as possible. And nobody wants to make their customers sick. So produce safety training helps producers identify and eliminate the potential for health hazards. You know what to look for? And when you see them, you can get rid of them. And it helps you grow and supply safer, nutritious food to your customers. The curriculum is the foundation of good ag practices 
knowledge for food safety and environmental management. And the notebook that you get with this training is two and a half inches thick full of pages <laughs> and you can get through it in an eight hour day. It, it's, you just keep trucking and plugging along and you learn more than you ever thought you could know. So there's eight areas of training and they're listed here. Introduction to produce safety, worker health, hygiene and training, soil amendments, wildlife, domestic animals and land use, ag water, what you use in watering the plants, and then ag water that you use post-harvest to clean them up and get them ready to ship, post-harvest handling and sanitation, and then developing your food safety, farm safety plan. So KFU and NFU entered into a collaborative agreement with FDA and our first, KFU's first annual agreement started in 2017. So what we have in our agreement for this uh, effort is we do educational activities for produce growers and they include the PSA pro grower training and that's where you get the notebook and at the completion of it, you're, you get a certificate that says you've completed it and you know the things to look for. Tours of specialty crop farms and businesses, educational workshops on pertinent topics. We have booths at various farm conferences and ag ag meetings. And uh, so we promote KFU and FISMA. We have a very active social media information outlets, um, at different places, and we write newsletter stories. So these are some of the places that we've had booths that were pretty exciting. And they're great ways to meet people. Uh, the first one is Great Plains Growers Conference. And that's where I met Don and Susan two years, year and a half ago when we were still having in-person meetings. Mother Earth News Fair, Kansas Rural Center's Farm and Food Conference, Women Managing the Farm, Farmers Union, and Farm Aid. So in 2017, we had our first collaborative agreement. We held nine farm tours in Northeast Kansas and part of those farms were veterans um, that are starting farming once they left the service. We had three tours in South Central Kansas by Wichita. We offered our produce safety training events through the KSU events because we weren't quite set up and running strongly enough to do our own. Uh, we had three educational workshops and what we do is we'd hold a workshop after those nine farm tours, we do three a morning, have a local lunch, and then we do an educational workshop in the afternoon. And so the first one was on what is FISMA, explaining it to growers. The second one was developing effective grant writing skills. And then the third one was record keeping for your farm and developing a business plan. In 2018, we had FISMA 2, um, North Central Kansas Tour, Thinking Outside the Box was our educational activity, one of them. We toured five farms. Uh, Depot Market is Dan Kuhn and he sells to Kroger and Dillon's and several places on a pretty large scale. Uh, CNC High Tunnels, Free Day Popcorn, sells popcorn to movie theaters and grows locally, Scandia Retail Store, Strickler Grazing, Polanski Seed, and Nebraska Shrimp Company actually grows shrimp in Nebraska in tanks. So our second learning activity was a bus tour to Iowa and we toured three different um, uh, farms. Farm Sweet Farm grows produce. Nee's Farm is an organic producer and Rossman Farm is a little bit of several things, diversified ag, livestock, popcorn, uh, looks like I got livestock there twice and they have an on the farm store. So we offered our produce safety the second year at K-State's uh, educational events. FISMA 3 was in 2019. We did nine farm tours in Northeast Kansas, seven farm tours in South Central Kansas in Hutchison and Wichita. We offered our own PSA training that year. We had a class in Wichita and a class in Bonner Springs. And the three educational workshops we did were on strengthening your relationships with your processor and customers. And that focused highly on meat relationships. Um, exploring NRCS equip 
high tunnel program and hoop house production. And then the third one was growing cash flow, planning the future of your farm. So that brings us to this year, 2021, the year of many challenges. We, we moved from on-farm tours to virtual tours because we couldn't get people together. The first tour is tonight with the Rami, Rami Farms, the Rommelfangers. And so that's at Beaumont, Kansas, Don and Susan Rommelfanger, uh, Simple Abundance Farm in South Hutchison, Maggie and Adam Pounds, and Mellowfield Farms in Lawrence, Jesse Asmussen and Kevin Prather. So tonight we invite you to enjoy Romney Farms. Welcome Don and Susan. Please welcome our webinar leaders, Billy Mitchell and Cal Jamerson. And I'm passing this back to you, Billy. All right, thank you so much, Mary. Those farm tours sound very cool. I would love to visit a popcorn farm. I don't know if, if any of y'all ever been on a shrimp boat, it is a terrifying experience. So the idea of maybe being able to grow shrimp inside just sounds a little less stressful. So that's, y'all have had some amazing experiences. So now I'd love to first introduce Cal, and then we'll ask Susan and Don to tell us a little bit about their farm and themselves. So Cal, if you'll let us know who you are, please. Cal Jamerson, I'm the State Produce Safety Extension Associate with K-State Research and Extension. My background is in open field cultivation. Great, thank you. And Susan and Don, will you tell us who you are and a little bit about your farm? Well, I'm so, Susan and- Of course, I'm Don. <laughs> and we're the Rommel Fingers. We actually live four miles west of Cassidy, not Beaumont. And it's in the middle of the Flint Hills of Kansas. So our uh, area is very rural. Uh, our nearest neighbor lives a mile from us. And we grow on a little over a half acre that was once, was, which is once a cattle pen. Um, when we purchased the property in 15, we had a vision to um, start a garden here and feed our family and our friends and our community. And since then we've grown to expand and we wrote an equip grant. So we have two high tunnels that we grow in year round. This was our first year round um, growing season through the Arctic blast. And um, it was quite a challenge and a learning experience. Um, we grow a variety of vegetables, including uh, greens, peppers, tomatoes, uh, squash, cucumbers, cut flowers. And we have an apiary here at the farm as well. We sell raw unfiltered um, wildflower fed honey. And we also sell five frame nucleus uh, hives to get people started as well. So we, uh, we love our honeybees and um, we do a lot of outreach and education as well in our local communities around. We also started a story walk this year, which includes uh, children's stories where they can kind of take a little tour around the farm. And uh, at the end of their little tour, they come to our growing area and we have a little training session on what either the way we grow or honeybees or uh, just a number of different uh, topics, topics that we tailor that we yeah to the groups yeah, yeah. So, like I say we started we bought the place in 2015 um, we both have been farm uh, gardening um, I uh, my profession is uh, actually raising turf I'm a groundskeeper supervisor of grounds at a local community college. So I've been growing turf for quite a while, but uh, we decided to garden. And like I say, we, we share that love uh, together and uh, hopefully our community is benefiting from that. Anything else? That's a little bit about it. Thanks for letting Yo, us be no. part of this tonight. It, it's been a pleasure to work with Mary and, and um, we've really enjoyed and learned a lot uh, in, in the process. So thank you so much. Yeah. I know Cal has been at our farm a few times. Actually, I think our farm was one of the first uh, training sessions we had in this area. And uh, that was really enlightening and, and 
we had, I don't know, what, eight or nine different local farmers come around from around the area came. And uh, we learned a lot. We, we learned there was a lot of things we needed to change and we have, and that has made things actually much better for us individually, so. Okay. Wow, y'all stay very busy. That's very inspiring. It's truly a diversified operation. Um, and somebody sent me a message just saying, what a great idea Storywalks is. I gotta say, that's, that's really inspiring. That's such a cool way to connect with the community yep. and get future beekeepers in line. Well, like I said, we have a, a 50 acre farm and we utilize just a half acre of that for the farm and the gardening and, and raising that. And so we have a, an area that we could utilize that you know people come to the farm and it gives them a chance to kind of see who we are. So, and they learn a little, learn, they go home knowing something more than they did. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, I'm, I just really appreciate y'all being involved and doing the work that you do. And so now we're going to take a virtual trip to your farm. And so just to kind of get everybody on the same page behind the scenes, my coworker Trisha is going to be playing us some video clips. After each clip, I'll probably ask Susan, Don, and Cal a question or two. Cal might have some feedback of his own. And if you have any feedback during that time, please utilize that chat box. You can ask any questions, send positive comments. And then once we wrap up the videos, we'll open up the floor for full on Q&A. And so with that, Trisha, will you take us to the farm, please? This um, will tell us the date that we're going to um, use to harvest. And then we can use this as our checklist and make sure that everything that we have here, our toilets and our hand washing facilities are available and cleanly, properly stocked. All of the criteria that meets our pre-harvest checklist is completed and then we can um, have that as our documentation. So that's pretty important. Um, sometimes when uh, you know we're in the midst of things, it's great just to have a printed checklist, not something like on Google spreadsheets, you know, you need something as far as a paper copy so that you can just check, 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 sign off on it, date it, and go. So before we harvest, we wash our hands. Get our bags. Practices. If you come up and look at the hand wash station, you don't have to have high tech or even the running water. They have a cooler with a lever that allows the water to free flow. They've got their soap and single use paper towels. A common mistake I see is rags, so that is all fantastic. And then we pick up our containers and we clean these. We have a log, and so we clean these twice a week. Uh oh. Okay, I think that's the stop of the first clip. Um, Susan and Don, I would love to know, where were we on your farm? And I already got one message. I've got two messages now. People really excited to see the farm and we dove right into the food safety stuff. So yeah. sorry y'all, but we will see more of the farm, but where, where were we on your farm right then? So when we first started out, we um, washed outside at our garden in a three vat sink. So if it was, raining, hailing, um, freezing. We were outside washing and we converted a three car garage stall of one. the north side, one of the stalls into a processing room. So with a little help from our, our son, AJ, uh, he, he came alongside of us and helped us get some lighting put together and we moved into the stall in the garage. Divided it off. <laughs> yeah. Split it off so it's completely separate. So we have a cooler in there. And then we also, on the other side is our three vat washing sink and our steel tables that we uh, process and move, move flow through. 
So it doesn't have to be high tech, but it sure beats uh, washing outside when it's when it's nasty. <laughs> the last farm that I got to live on, Julia, the farmer, loved clipboards and paper records. And so it brought some joy to my heart to see your clipboard and paper record. Can you talk about why you chose paper over electronic and just how that influences um, your record keeping? Yeah, I have lots of clipboards at our farm. <laughs> I have a clipboard for just about everything. Um, and I'm able to take that documentation then and put it in my three ring binder and have that um, for my records and that really helps me keep organized and um, lets our staff know exactly what's going on. So if technology is not working, it's we still have that paper in place and the flow can continue, which is very important for us here, um, knowing you know where everything is and, and our staff being able to function in a, in a good way. That helps, that helps to keep everything flowing in the right direction. We don't have to worry about our employees handling that technology other than at market where it's really necessary. Yeah, we do have a cell phone policy uh, here at the farm and, stays in their car. and all of them stay in their cubby. So uh, none, none of the phones go to, to the garden with us. That sounds, as a former farm manager, that sounds very dreamy. We had a lot of tough conversations about cell phone use in the farm, because not only is it a risk, it's just very distracting yes. sometimes. Yes. And I noticed that you built your own hand wash station. Why, why was it important to have a hand wash station in, the, in that area? Well, for one thing, it, it's very efficient uh, because it's right there. Um, we, we do have uh, outside hydrants, but having it right there in the processing room um, just really works for us. And um, it helps remind people that they need to continually be, be conscious of, what, of, of our food safety and our, our cleanliness on the farm. Very cool. Yeah, if we're going to ask folks to wash their hands, it's really nice to actually have a place and a comfortable place. It's inside, it's yeah. warm. And Kale, did you have any just first impressions? Do you remember the first time you walked into that space <laughs> and anything you took away? Actually, the I was telling them the last time I was there, because I came out to that farm in my first year, I kind of wish we had documented and recorded it as a case study because each year they have a fantastic organic growth to how they do production post harvest market. So it's, so it's real applicable to the growers of Myron to see that look, you can start and just get going and then grow to what they are now. It, unfortunately, like I said, we had the pictures, the map, we could show all that, but I didn't think any of that at the time. That is, I mean, yeah, that one of my many uh, things I missed out on when managing was I always was like, we should take more pictures so we can document our growth, not just for ourselves, but also to show future employees to be like, this is what it looked like. And this is what we've been able to do as a team and the improvements that we've been able to make. It is always really nice. And it looks like we've also just got a link in the chat box if folks are interested in building their own hand washing station. And so next, I think we're going to head outside on the farm and see a little bit of the well. So Tricia, if you'll take us outside. Oh, well. <laughs> irrigation system. This is our point of irrigation. So we have one well that is designated for, specifically for our farming, which includes a portion of it waters the animals. This portion is specifically for watering our garden. And it comes up to this point where we have um, two systems. One is for the main pipe tunnel where we have mostly tomatoes and cucumbers and greens. The other side is mostly for everything else, it includes the smaller height tunnel and what's outside. Also included in with this is a fertigation system. It, uh, 
meters, a certain parts per million of fertilizer into our uh, drip irrigation system. And it's protected with a backflow preventer uh, going through the fertigation. So one of your considerations with your well, um, depth can be important, especially if you're near livestock. If it's a shared source, always have backflow prevention, especially if you're running any type of synthetic, be it a fertilizer or anything else through the feed. And then we talked about the potable hoses for distribution through. And do you want to talk about your water testing a little bit? Um, so we tested our water with um, the K-State um, research center and use their um, option of uh, free testing, free water testing. And so we collect it in uh, the sample bottles and then send it to K-State and they test it for us up to three times a year. And last year we had, um, in October, we tested our water and it came back within normal limits. And right now we're actually, any grower that wants to get tested however many times we'll test it. Originally it was up to 10 samples you could do, um, but we'll do it as many times as you want to send it in. How often do you recommend that, Go. It would depend on the water source, if you're using surface or well. Um, if you're doing a well, it's a good idea that first year to pull probably four samples, and then after that, just once a year. It's different if you're going to be covering the produce safety rule versus you're just following good agricultural practices. Great. I, I want to say, Susan and Don, you all have good camera presence. I would have been nervous. I've had to shoot these videos before, and you seem very relaxed. And Susan, it looks like you are doing double duty. Like you had a harvest bin full of some produce at the same time. So I, I'm very impressed. Well, we, we've had a little practice. Our uh, youngest daughter, Kate, was the one that was actually filming for us. She was uh, assisting us on the farm that day. So. Uh, it helps when you have friends and, and family around you to, to uh, keep you calm as well. But uh, she's she's been really great working with us here at the farm as well. So we, we've had a little practice. Yeah. yeah, a little practice. It wasn't our first round. <laughs> Susan brings a lot of interesting things to the farm. <laughs> Do you, for people that have never gotten a water test before, do you have any advice? Was it was it stressful the first time? Any tips? I think being consistent is important and just making sure that you uh, com complete the system and follow all of the instructions on on the water uh, uh, the water taste testing uh, kit. Uh, making sure that you handle all the bottles with gloves and that you're pulling everything the, the same and just that really helps a lot. Right. Actually, we we had kind of a nightmare the first time we sent tests in. I think we had three samples we sent in that didn't qualify that were contaminated somehow. So it is very critical that you follow the instructions, um, get the things in the mail immediately and just careful handling things. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, that could be really stressful. And I imagine maybe back then there was a cost associated. And so, yeah, not. Actually, that was first year. Uh, oh, cool. I think that they offered that. Yeah. They were free testing then, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've been so very, we very fortunate to work with Cal and also with the labs at K-State at the Olathe Research Center and also um, in Manhattan on campus and working, being able to work with uh, the, the doctors there and um, the experts has been a huge, uh, huge life-saving kind of eye-opening experience for us. They give us so much data that then we're able to make changes based on the reports and um, it's just very easy to communicate with them and very easy to, to get them sent. And Cal, I have two questions for you. Uh, the first is, is that program still running, the water test, the free water test? And the second is, we just talk a little bit more about why that backflow preventer was so important. 
So the free testing, I believe, goes through September of this year. Um, I don't know if they're applying for another extension with COVID, but the hope is we can keep doing it because both labs are set up now. The backflow is critical because the worst thing you can do is introduce a contaminant into your well. Uh, it works outside of even if you're just using it for synthetic chemical fertilizers or other routes. Because once your well has that contaminant, you then have to go through the treatment process, which Susan could actually talk about a little bit what they went through there. We actually learned in that process that it, it's pretty common for wells in Kansas to have a low contamination baseline level to start. So once you test your well, you'll know where you're at with numbers and then how to safely use the water from there. Great, thank you. And then there was one other thing that pricked my ears and it was this potable water hose. And so I, had, I had asked Don about that earlier. If you could maybe just say where you found yours, because to me that sounds very exotic, but maybe it's not. <laughs> Actually, uh, most any, any garden center, uh, uh, outlet will carry I me mean, if they carry things for uh, RVs, camp, for and, campers. RVs and campers. So yeah. you go to that camping session section of your hardware stores and they usually have a potable garden hose there. And one thing I wanted to touch on our wells, uh, Cal started to, anyway, we have, we've located four wells on this 50 acres and they have a little contaminant problem that we've taken care of. And uh, talking to the state, well, I learned a lot about underground water systems. So <laughs> four wells, if one's contaminated, they're all contaminated, even if you don't have bad tests in one or the other one. So we have, we had a little issue and we corrected that problem. And now we're operating off of two wells. And to me, the big takeaway with that was when you get that bad test result, try not to, it's easier to stay on our end from the education side, but don't, don't freak out too much because we'll get you through it. And then the important thing about the testing is you then know your water quality. Because again, no one wants to make their consumer sick. And then it's, to me, from the ag production background, it's horrible to grow a beautiful crop and feed people and then be, you know, inadvertently using bad water. So... It's nice that there's so many resources in Kansas so that if you do have a small issue, you can really get support and backup to be able to take care of it. So I think next there was just a brief discussion on the farm about wildlife. And so Tricia, if you'll play us that clip. Another thing I'll point out with the farm too is you'll see all the measures they take for prevention of wildlife with fencing and other aspects. It's Important on the produce safety side because as soon as feces gets near a crop, it's bad for your consumers. But also, it's all of you know, it's it's hard to be a farmer. Nothing's worse than planting and growing a beautiful crop and then Bambi coming in and eating your stuff. In those cases, reach out to Extension, work with the wildlife folks to help you save your crops and take advantage of that. And on the wildlife side, when they mention birds getting in, the question is. What's your reaction when a bird does get in? How do you get it out? And then what do you do if it starts eating on the plant? And if it lands on the plant and leaves you a nice feces presence, um, what would you do in response to that? The birds are a little, sometimes difficult to usher out, but eventually, I mean, it, within 10 or 15 minutes, the birds are pretty much gone and they don't back in they realize after smacking their heads on the roof a few times they're gone um, as far as leaving its presence on the plants we would identify that area remove the portion of the plant that has the feces on it um, if it's on the ground it would be probably marked flagged a certain way so we knew that that's an area we work around. I always encourage removal of feces. I'm not a fan of leave or bury. Kale, you're truly a produce safety person because you said, I think you said a nice feces. 
at first. Only a produce safety person could view it that way. And you know, I have been in hoop houses when the birds get in there. And Dom, when you said that the birds kind of smacking against the plastic, it, it's a just a strange thing to watch. And you really have to wait for them to get their way out of there. And I was hoping you could talk just a little bit more about yeah how you how you do handle that and what's happening when there is bird poop on the tomatoes or tomatoes dropped to the ground. Well, we've kind of eliminated our openings. Uh, we've put insect netting up even over the vents. So uh, they have a hard time getting back in there, but yeah, they, they can still get in there. The doors open and they, they swoop in. Um, you just watch, try not to keep them in there any longer than you can and, and inspect the area when you, you know, when they're, when they're gone. So if you find things, clean it up. Last year we had um, a couple of hummingbirds um, that decided they wanted to take up residence in one of, in the small tunnel. And so uh, we had to discourage that really quickly because they were getting really comfortable. They fly in almost every day. And so uh, uh, I have this uh, big stick that I have a tennis ball on the end of it. And um, I would just walk around the perimeter and and encourage them to go outside. <laughs> yeah. it's... That, make, biggest, that makes sense. We... Yeah. Our biggest issue are our four-legged critters that yeah. think they own, own our garden. So <laughs> they make themselves home. So we have a uh, chicken wire all the way around our our garden area um, to keep the rabbits out. And then we have a three, three wire electric fence also that goes all the way around the garden uh, along with the bob wire too. So um, at night, I also play a radio um, like every third night just to, to, to get some sound out there that discourages uh, raccoons and deer from showing up as well. So I've gotten pretty creative about how to, how to fend off those pesky uh, wildlife friends that are living around us. Yeah. Is there a certain station that works better than others? Have you experimented with? Yeah, I just turn it on rock because yeah. I like rock. <laughs> <laughs> and Kale, have you seen? Oh. <laughs> we don't have neighbors that we're worried yeah. about. So. Oh, that's right. They're a mile away. So you could really turn it up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kale, are there other creative solutions you've seen for keeping wildlife and pests out? I've seen where people will take a shock post and amp it up and put peanut butter on it to encourage the deer to come touch right there and it shocks them pretty good. Personally, I'm also a fan of the lethal measures when populations get out of control. Uh, it's not everyone's bag, which I understand. And then for different animals, there's different things. Birds, you can do air rangers. There are those gumbies you see flying in used parking lots. You can put screamers on them and mylar tape. So it kind of depends on what you got for wildlife. The takeaway with the rule is the produce safety rule wildlife is just a part of farming it's not about you having to keep them excluded 24 7 or you can't sell the produce it's about taking the steps that they do at their farm where you identify the wildlife you have and then preventive measures to keep them out of the fields and in response you're doing that stuff you're doing pretty good in the rules eyes great thank you so i think we're going to move on to the compost pile your field and row crops and another thing they're doing fantastic is you'll see the compost pile down towards the bottom of the slope away from the production areas with protection measures in place to safeguard it from wildlife and other things avoid the temptation of putting your compost pile in the middle of your field it's logistically easier but it takes your risks through the roof especially if you're using manure base so Susan and Don, will you, will you talk a little bit more about how you chose that spot for your compost pile? Was it a conscious decision or did it just start getting built yeah. there? Actually, it was just a, the low part of the lot out of the way. Um, it's 
it was just, I don't know, just kind of a non-brainer just to put it down low and, and the water. So we do have a little water problem. Uh, our garden is above our garden is row crops. And when there's no crops in that field, when it rains, it just kind of inundates our garden. And you couldn't see it, but behind Cal, we built a little berm along that fence line and actually had to build it up prior to that, that year prior to gardening because the year before it really washed out a good section of it. But the compost pile was kind of put down to that corner because that's, that's kind of the, where the rain water, the runoff kind of ends up being anyway. So, um, I don't know, just kind of a good place to put it out of the way. Yeah, it's definitely a good place. And Kale, do you have any other suggestions just about thinking about that placement of manure, compost piles? I would say do exactly like they did. Know your farm, your topography, and put it in the location that will not contaminate your produce. Don't overthink it. Uh, produce safety, it's, it's pretty practical when you approach it and keep it simple and logical. Keep it simple. So we're, we're gonna visit one last spot. I think we're gonna go very briefly to the cold storage and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Commodities do better at different temperatures for your post-harvest and your shelf life. There are fact sheets and guides and tutorials on that. It's always beneficial to have a great relationship with Extension because we are here to help you in those regards. When I said very briefly, I was not joking. That was a, a much too short visit, but I would love to know just what type of refrigeration y'all have and how you made the choice of what you're using right now. Well, right now we just have a three door cooler. It was given but well we purchased it but it was given we susan's cousin had this in a flower shop and she had no use for it anymore so uh it's in our in our production room but uh we also have a small room um where we've put a cool bot in and some extra shelving and it's actually um above a uh, underground um storm shelter so it has a concrete floor and insulated sides but it's just a little tiny building so um like i say we insulated it and put a cool body in it and, and it works it's uh kind of our backup area anyway but most everything is hopefully the produce produce we have doesn't stay in a cooler more than just a week or so That's great. I, I love that simple solution because we see a lot of farmers invest in really big cold storage. You end up losing a lot of money on just electricity bills, and then there's more things to clean, and there's more things to sanitize. Right. And I think we, we've really seen a, a dialed-in picture, and I think for just a second, we're actually going to see kind of a bird's-eye view of the farm. Is that right, Cal? Are you going to take us up? We're going to see if my computer will let me do it. I might have to be a co-host. Let me stop my video for a sec. And then with some luck, you guys will see that. We're in luck. In my screen? Okay, that's what I like to hear. So let me switch to laser pointer. So what you kind of miss with the zoom in, this isn't the most current Google Earth view, but you can see they've got one of their tunnels here. But they've got that protective barrier running outside with the fencing. They've also got fruit trees and stuff over here now. Again, it was talking about that organic growth that they're doing year in, year out. That manure piles right down here, compost pile. And then let me see, we might be able to see the diversion berm a little bit. Not great. Let me switch to magnifying. So he was talking about to the east is where he's got the fields of row crops. And then if there's, if there's rain and there's no crop there, they get heavy rain. So he identified a risk, which is what we want you to do. And then in response, he's got that berm that diverts the water from the crop. It's actually twofold the produce safety. 
you get water constantly coming in there and sitting and you're going to get different diseases, mold, pest presence. And then if not properly treated over time, they can become established. So then you're going to fight something year round. A couple of other things to point out right here, you'll see this up here is that post harvest area when you saw inside the videos, the well right here with all the other stuff. And then if, if any of the Susan or Don, if you want me to point out or talk about anything else while I have it up, I just wanted everyone to be able to see it kind of from that bird's eye view. So yeah. So actually, the yeah. well, actually, the hydrant is right there by the high tunnel, Cal, but the well is actually over in the small building to the west, um, where the, uh, the yeah, yes. that building, that's actually where the well is, and it's dedicated to the garden, and it's also dedicated to our, our um, like. chicken, our chickens and our ducks. Um, coop here to the northwest. Yeah. So um, yes, that's uh, I think that's the well, and then we have one dedicated to the house, which is yeah. Over. Yeah, the house well is totally different than the than the garden well. I mean, they're two separate wells, but they're still on the same aquifer, so the contamination is still, you know, one can contaminate the other. So that's something everybody needs to remember. I was, I was thinking a well is a well, but it's the same aquifer. So if you have one contamination, you have two. Yeah, thank you for that. And Cal, thanks. I felt like you took us up in a hot air balloon for a second. It was really <laughs> nice to see the farm from that way. So we've got a little bit of time. We've got a really great audience. So you're more than welcome now if you'd like to come off mute or put something in the chat box. But if anybody has any questions or you just want to express your thanks and tell them how lovely things look, uh, we've got some time. There was a, I just saw a question. Is there an off, off farm uh, income. income? And yes, I do work full time uh, off the farm. Like I say, I'm a ground supervisor at a small community college here. If I can, please. I would just like to say thank you. I mean, food safety is kind of a, can be kind of a vulnerable spot, I think sometimes. And so helping us all learn through your experience and showing us your property and your operation is, um, just fantastic. So thank you for being leaders in this and um, yeah, excited to visit Kansas. Thank you for all you've done. Very good information. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You've got a couple more thank yous in the chat box. Yeah, we're like, if there's any questions. Yeah, questions. No, you can talk. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so I have a comment and a question. We all know we're talking about contamination of produce grown on farms because of the listeria outbreak in Colorado in the cantaloupes. And listeria, which I never heard of before that event was 2011, uh, it's deadly. It's uh, bacteria. So while y'all were talking, I Googled it how did the cantaloupe get listeria? And so Wikipedia says, another possible route to contamination was a truck kept next to the processing line that went to and from a cattle operation. And I knew the listeria came from a cattle operation, but I thought that they were watering their cantaloupe with, with water that came, that was contaminated by a, a contained animal feed operation. That's what I had thought. And it says, in addition, the Colorado farm did not cool its cantaloupes before placing them in cold storage. 
which may have caused condensation that promoted the growth of listeria. So what do you all think? I mean, hold on to your hat. Now somehow you've got to cool this produce before you put it into the cooler, like you'd have to pick it first thing in the morning, I guess. Do you do anything like that? So, so yeah. Oh, go ahead, Cal. I'll, I'll just talk about, let me think how to word this. Okay. When you have the problem and they go back and they're trying to troubleshoot, uh, a lot of those maize could have well been the case. Could the cattle, and it was parked outside the pack house, could that have contributed? Yes. Could the not having that cooling step have contributed? Yes. What's most likely is they weren't using a sanitizer in the washing of the cantaloupe. So then if you had a listeria contaminant on one cantaloupe, it can contaminate that entire water source. So that's where it's beneficial to just to know your risk profile. And if you're washing produce, if you can remove the wash step, it makes your life easier. And if not, you really have to understand sanitizers and how to use them to prevent cross-contamination. Um, you know, one of the things they've mentioned in that report is that there could have been low-level listeria contaminant in the fields. Yeah, that's going to be every farm you go to that's outdoor production. So again, it, it's it's never going to be sterile. Um, and it's, it's all about knowing the risk and then how to mitigate them. So we, we grow a lot of greens here at our farm, spinach, tot soy, mizuna, lettuces, uh, kale. kale. And we do a three vat wash with a uh, sanitizer called Sanidate 5.0. And that just makes, gives us peace of mind and it's good food safety procedures to wash your produce. Yes. Um, I'm very adamant that we wash and we spin and we package and we put right in the coolers. So um, it's a process that we all have uh, engaged in and we know how, how it works and we, everybody yep. gets, gets involved and we're all cleaning and packaging and storing right away. And yes, we do in, in Kansas, it's when summer gets here, the temperatures get very, very warm. So um, I don't like to harvest after nine o'clock because it's just too hot for your greens, for our greens anyway. And so um, there's 530 mornings that we're out um, hoofing it at, the, you know, yep. getting everything cut and then back to the processing room and washed and packed and, and recorded right. and put away. So yeah, uh, it's, it's not a glamorous life that some people would want to embrace, um, but I'm a morning person, so it doesn't bother me. Um, and <laughs> the not. people that work for us are somewhat morning people uh, or they can be at times when they need to be. We don't harvest every day um, at our farm, we have a community supported agriculture program that leaves our farm twice a week. And then we do um, pop up tents and farmers markets as well. So uh, we don't harvest every day. Yeah. If it can stay in the field, it's better there and it's fresher there. Yeah. So it's only harvested prior to us. 36 so hours before they actually receive it, we've, we've harvested. And some commodities, uh, if they're if they're dirty, it's going to affect your consumers. No one wants to see dirt on their lettuce. Same thing if you got root crops. But if you're doing tomatoes, cubes, peppers, and you can remove the wash step, it makes your life easier, better, and it makes the produce safer because you're not adding that potential contaminant. If you if you do wash, I, I would encourage you to follow exactly what Susan said. If, you're, if you don't like chlorine, there are the periacetics and organics like Sanidate that will control the risk from watching the produce. Mm -hmm. yep. Wow, well, thanks y'all. I mean, Susan and Don, I wanna say the way that you just carry yourselves and you care about your community, I find that to be very inspiring. It makes me wanna embrace this type of life. It feels glamorous to have such a full uh, life and to be surrounded by so much family and, and great employees and good food. 
so we're getting towards the end. I just want to say thank you again for letting us visit your farm. I hope we get to visit in person someday. Sure. Uh, there'll be a link in the chat box for all the attendees. Kale, thank you as always for your expertise and your just good personality and good vibes. I learned so much from you and I can tell that these farmers do as well. And I also just wanna say thank you so much to the Kansas Farmers Union. And I think we have one last slide just to advertise the next two virtual farm tours. Thursday, April 22nd, very excited to go out to Simple Abundance Farm. And then on April 29th, we'll be visiting Mellowfields Farm. So if you'd like more information, please go to kansasfarmersunion.org. And Charlie, you're on it. The link is in the chat box. And so with that, I just want to say thanks again to everybody who attended. Thank you again so much to Susan, Don, Kale, and the Kansas Farmers Union. And I'm excited to see everyone in person sometime soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hello.